this scenario, will it be one of your uh, programs to have a dialogue with the Department of Justice to have a full complement of a court, meaning that uh, daily there must be a judge, a prosecutor, and a public attorney in order that these things may materialize. You uh, take uh, justice. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, uh, the first thing I would do, if appointed, would really be to set dialogues with all the various stakeholders and the key officials of the institution. And the purpose of this dialogue is really to lay down the, the framework or the groundwork of my vision. I will seek their cooperation and ask them to actively participate in achieving my vision, thereby creating a culture of inclusivity and empowerment. So that is really the first thing that I would do. I will hear from them their problems, and I will give them also the, um, the groundwork of my vision in such a way that um, uh, we can hear uh, both sides and all sides of the problem and uh, find a concrete solution to it. Thank you, Justice. To be a truly independent and co-equal branch of the government, do you think that Supreme Court justices should be elected by the people? Uh, I don't think so, Your Honor, because um, this profession is really very um, important in terms of public service and in terms of uh, and this is imbued with public interest. And uh, I don't think they should be elected. I think they should really undergo a process which is being done by the uh, JBC in so far as determining their integrity competence, probity, and independence. Now, we have been talking about reforms, and uh, if appointed as Chief Justice, what court reform would your honor prioritize? Well, Your Honor, I can uh, divide my reforms into, um, in accordance with my vision. Uh, first, uh, on the decongestion of dockets, I have said earlier that we, I, I will prioritize the implementing rules on the, um, the uh, Judge uh, at Large Act as well as the Family Courts Act. And I will um, seek a codification of all uh, rules of procedure. Plus, uh, I will also urge the FILJA to create a template for courts not only for orders in the special commercial courts or other specialized courts, but also for um, decisions and resolutions of the, um, the lower court judges. And um, for, would you like to hear also, yeah. Your Honor, about Go ahead, uh, please. Uh, in so far as corruption and accountability, I will also um, activate the Judicial Integrity Board so that um, complaints against judges, other court personnel, as well as um, including court administrators uh, can be heard by them, can be investigated. And likewise, I would also seek the creation of the Committee on Ethics and Ethical Standards of the Supreme Court so that we ourselves can really go through investigation uh, for cases against involving graft and corruption and other violations of the ethical standards. Thank you, Justice Perlas Bernabe. Thank you, Your Honor. That was my last question, and uh, good luck. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much, uh, Judge de Monteverde, Justice Tiham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, Chief. Good afternoon, we are honored. I address you as chief because when I was still in the court, you were my senior. And uh, the word chief is, a, is music to one's ears. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for waiting for about an hour and a half at the dignitaries lounge. So I'll ask you an easy question first. What is the Morillo Velarde map? 
which you saw inside the dignitary lounge? Well, Your Honor, it's the, um, I'm not uh, uh, too well versed on this map, but it I know a, it's It the, was a Christmas gift given by Senior Associate Justice Tony Carpio last year mm -hmm. to all members of the court. Well, it, I know, Your Honor, but it pictures there the, um, the West Philippine Sea, uh, the Scarborough Shoal, and uh, the exclusive economic zones, the, the nautical miles where the Philippines can claim sovereignty and sovereign rights. We, we in the JBC have decided that whenever we interview applicants for judgeship, if they were not paying attention at the dignitary mm -hmm. lounge and could not explain what the Murillo Bellarde map is, we will not shortlist them. Your Honor, we were held in at the library. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's talk about judicial independence. Your son works in Malacanang, in the office of the executive secretary. But in some cases, filed before the Supreme Court, you voted against the government. So it's either there were no influence exerted upon you, or if there were, you were impervious to such influence. Do you feel conflicted when you make decisions which may ultimately run against the interest of government? Um, no, Your Honor, because my son and I are governed by the separation of powers doctrine, he in the executive and I myself in the judicial. You dissented in the majority decision in the petition for co warranto petition filed by the Solicitor General Kalita. But in your dissent, you did not say that the then Chief Justice was totally blameless. You were just saying that it was the wrong mode. It should have been impeachment. You also dissented in the decision relating to the extension of martial law and things uh, like this. No, you know, I, I did not dissent in the extension of the martial law. Oh, you concurred? I concurred. Oh, I see. My, my, my mistake. All right. Talking about the Morillo Velarde map given by Senior Associate Justice Antonio Carpio, if you are Chief Justice, would you be comfortable talking to media? about matters of which you feel are matters of national interest or paramount importance? No, Your Honor, because um, my first duty is to the court, being a justice, and therefore um, I would feel uncomfortable um, speaking about issues like that because uh, these issues might come to court and it's a way that I'll not be able to really voice out my opinion on cases like this. The work of a Chief Justice is enormous. Are you even aware of a judicial bureaucracy? <clears throat> the judiciary is the third branch of government. So you have the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. I have not seen in the premises of the Supreme Court a map of the judiciary. Or even if there is, it could be a map, a network of courts distributed. So you have the first and second level courts, you have the third level courts, appellate courts, and then the Supreme Court. More or less, there are 1,888 judges in the first and second level. And uh, 2014 in the Supreme Court, 50, 15 in the Supreme Court, 59 in the Court of Appeals, 21 in the Sandigan Bayan, 9 in the Court of Tax Appeals. It is important for a Chief Justice to take hold of this mammoth organization. How can you effectively monitor this vast organization, taking into account that 
the office of the court administrator is only composed of a few, few people. As Chief Justice, how can you effectively monitor the performance? Um, Your Honor, that's going to be my first plan of action. Uh, I can monitor one station through the executive judges. Um, I can also monitor um, other stations through the OCA, the Office of the Court Administrator, but uh, since right now uh, they're really undermanned, then the I have to push through with the computerization because it's only through the computerization project that I will be able to monitor the performance of its judge in terms of um, their case disposition, uh, case management, and case load. But judge, judges is only one part of the spectrum. The other part are the lawyers, which are also under the Supreme Court. Yes, Your Honor. Um, because the Supreme Court grants the license to lawyers to practice law. But the question is, who police the ranks of the lawyers? The, I, the IBP cannot effectively police the ranks of the lawyers. Some lawyers don't even attend IBP activities. Some lawyers don't even pay their IBP dues. So how do you intend, as Chief Justice, to monitor lawyers as well? Because knowing that if lawyers misbehave and judges misbehave as well, then the judicial system will fall. Your Honor, uh, in the com one of the computerization projects is the lawyer information system, wherein you can determine from there the good standing of the lawyers, the penalties that were imposed on them, and whether or not um, they are um, still in active practice or not. So probably this could really be of help, plus of course, well, the IBP can do a little help also, Your Honor. With the signing into law of the judges at large, mandating the hiring of 100 RTC judges and 50 MTC judges, as Chief Justice, is it your intention to fully commission all of this? Judges at large? Your Honor, the first thing I would do is to coordinate with the Office of the Court Administrator to determine uh, where uh, the judges are needed. So depending on the needs of the courts, then that's uh, probably the time that we need to implement even partially the Judges at Large Act. Former Vice President Bina wrote a letter to the Chief Justice and we were furnished a copy. And he was complaining about the practice of some trial court judges in the arbitrary computation of the trouble bond, bond computed at an amount equal to the alleged civil liability of the accused or 200% of the bail bond or in certain cases even higher regardless of the personal circumstances of the accused and he says he argues that this is this is discriminatory because some of the accused may not be well off is this something that can be attended to well your honor that's Chief really Justice? well that's really part of the access to justice so i think we really have to study that um because I even in the filing of cases there are those who are called indigents and exempt from the filing from the filing fees so I think we should also consider the status of these convicts when it comes to um, uh, securing bail bonds. Many members of the court have retired uh, last year and uh, this year. In your opinion, is it permissible for the court to revisit or even overturn decisions previously adopted by the court when the ponente and majority of those who concurred have already retired? Well, Your Honor, um, overturning jurisprudence is really based on the merits of the case. Uh, we just don't overturn jurisprudence if they are really founded uh, by law and um, and the uh, previous jurisprudence. But the problem is uh, when this jurisprudence uh, has no more factual basis because of the realities of the times, then uh, it should really be abandoned and overturned. 
In your PDS, it is stated that you attended several, several training programs, both in the Philippines and in abroad. And on two occasions, uh, we were together in, that, in certain conventions. In 2019, you went to Russia for a conference. 2018, Singapore, France, and Argentina. In 2017, Italy, Thailand, in the United Kingdom, to cite a few. If appointed as Chief Justice, will you continue to participate in these conferences and training programs? No more, Your Honor. I think there's a lot of work to do here. Uh, I don't think I could really um, uh, travel anymore because of the administrative and adjudicative functions of the Supreme, Supreme Court Chief Justice. As Chief Justice... Except, of course, Your Honor, on very important occasions that a Chief Justice presence is required. As Chief Justice, are you willing to rationalize uh, availability of attendance in international conferences and training program to deserving judges nationwide? Make it available to them. Yes, Your Honor. In fact, um, as chairman of the Subcommittee on Commercial Courts, as well as the um, Public Courts and Juvenile um, Concerns, I have been asking some of the lower court judges to really attend these conferences. But should preference be given to those who are outstanding judges? Because if they're outstanding, they're already trained. Or should it be given to those who have who may not have outstanding performances because they have less training. Well, Your Honor, the last time I had, uh, I was asked to designate five judges to attend the Women Judges Conference and other Women Judges Conference. I, I drew by lot um, the selection of these judges. I ask this question to the other applicant. In Bali, Indonesia, there is a, a law, a proposed law, to ban and penalize premarital sex. If that kind of a law is adopted in the Philippines and a petition reaches the Supreme Court, in your opinion, and by way of academic discussion only, theoretically, would you consider that law constitutional or unconstitutional, a law that would ban premarital sex, not amounting to prostitution or something else? Um, well, Your Honor, um, as of now, I don't think there is really a prohibition in our law and in the Constitution, and uh, it may be argued that um, to restrict that or to render it unconstitutional would uh, infringe the right to uh, liberty and uh, freedom of expression. What is your understanding of academ academic freedom? Well, academic freedom, Your Honor, is um, freedom from interference insofar as academic institutions are concerned with respect to their goals and objectives. And, uh, of course, it may include um, the right to choose the subjects that they would want to teach uh, the people who, who will teach and how they will be taught, including the right to, uh, to admit the students in their schools. Does allowing students to go out to the streets to demonstrate and air grievances, legitimate grievances against the government, an exercise of academic freedom? Well, um, the students, Your Honor. Yes. Well, it's, it's really a right uh, to free expression. It's more of a freedom of expression, Your Honor, not the right of uh, academic freedom, because academic freedom relates to uh, school institutions, the institutions are of um, education. And corollary to that, can the school administrators <clears throat> penalize professors, teachers, who allow their students to go out into the streets and demonstrate to air legitimate grievance against 
the government uh, as an don't. exercise of academic freedom, the school administrators sanctioning professors and teachers who allow their students to go out and demonstrate? Your Honor, I don't think that would be uh, included in the um, academic freedom of the schools. And one final question. You are now number four in the senior seniority list. Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> Whatever reforms you would like to implement will need the collective collegial action of the bank. You feel you have moral ascendancy over the other members of the bank? Um, definitely, Your Honor. I'm very collegial. And uh, I think um, with... Um, with proper justification, I don't think uh, they will reject any proposal I will make. Without mentioning names, what are your pet peeves in the court during court deliberation? Meaning, Your Honor? The things you hate during court deliberations without mentioning names or people. Well, Your Honor, probably uh, the senseless uh, dissents and um, arguments which have no basis in law and jurisprudence. All right, that's my last questions. Thank you and uh, good luck. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much, Justice the, um, Judge Hilo. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Justice, Your Honor. Justice uh, Stella Bernabe. We had uh, interviewed you last year and it's very it was really extensive and I will not ask questions that previously asked this morning you may have uh, been given tip of what my questions are so among the applicants for chief justice you have the highest net worth at 55 million could you explain to the public the just justification for such? Well, uh, Your Honor, be, um, I entered the judiciary <coughs> in 1996, um, and we had already accumulate, accumulated uh, a little wealth. My husband is engaged in business, and uh, I was um, earning uh, from private and uh, government uh, institutions since um, 1987, Your Honor, since 1977. And our office received... Pan samantala po muna nating puputuli ng ating special coverage upang magbigay daan sa Lotto Draw. Huwag po kayong aalis, magbabalik pa po ang special coverage selecting the 26th Justice, a public interview.